And hello, welcome to Open, the show that's opening the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I am Darren Jaime, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough and New York City. Coming up, we'll delve into some of the most common challenges that homeowners face when trying to create an eerie ambiance in their homes. We'll explain that a little bit later on. Then following that, we have an insightful discussion lined up where we'll explore the intersection of crypto assets, artificial intelligence, and the future of currency that's coming up in a digital conference. The next on the agenda will shine a spotlight on the noteworthy films featured in this year's African Diaspora International Film Festival. And then subsequently, we'll examine how augmented reality to be a valuable tool to enhance the learning experience in the classroom. And then lastly, we take a closer look at the initiatives undertaken by Bronx Community College to ensure that all students have equal and equitable access to educational opportunities. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way because right now we're officially open. Hello everyone, I am Darren Jaime and you're now watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers to the Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast simultaneously on MNN's channel. You can stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Some things have been going on through the past week. We'll take you through it with some Bronx updates. Uh, we kick off with big developments in business news. It was revealed small businesses based in the Bronx now have the opportunity to apply for the newly inaugurated $10 million Community Advantage Loan Fund. Now, the fund is aiming to support and empower local businesses in the Bronx community. Our BronxNet reporter, Brittany schuyler Aubain brings us the details. Businesses in the South Bronx are about to level up. When you invest in businesses, you invest in the future. At Create Hub, in the 3rd Avenue section of the Bronx, the Bronx Economic Development Corporation, Bronx Borough President Vanessa Gibson, and Congressman Richie Torres announced the newly launched $10 million Community Advantage Loan Fund. What we're talking about here is making sure that we are focused on those small businesses that have a need, that have a need for uh, working capital. If accepted into the program, small businesses could receive anywhere from a $5,000 to a $350,000 loan to help purchase equipment and upscale their business to prevent doors closing. Unspent money that's remained on the table since 1994 when Bill Clinton was president. And all these years, 20 years, this money has never been spent. Now we have an opportunity to create that access for small businesses, for our foundation, the fabric of our communities. Now for those who may not qualify for the loan, Walsh recommends that business owners don't give up because there are other alternatives. We want to start there. We will refer those candidates to small business development centers, but we don't want businesses to give up. We want them to reach out, and if we could help them in another way, we'll do that. For business owners like Gabriel Cancella, who owns Sneakeresque, a sneaker cleaning business, this program is a game changer. Cancella says he gets great feedback from his growing clientele, even though he is the only person involved in the business. He emphasizes how this loan could help expand his inventory, staff, and branding. It can really help pay employees, uh, production, labor, and anything extra. I would love to get into getting deliveries, paying people to do deliveries, shipping, you know, all of that stuff will definitely help my business. The applications for the Community Advantage Loan Fund are now open. All involved are encouraging small business owners to take advantage of the opportunity to build a better Bronx. Reporting for BronxNet, Brittany schuyler Albain. And thank you, Brittany. In other news, hip-hop legend KRS-One held a block party 
honoring the 50th birthday of hip hop. A Broxit reporter, Chanel Thompson, has a story. What's up, everyone? We are here at the birthplace of hip-hop at 1520 Cedric Avenue, and you know what it is. This is the 50 Years of Hip-Hop, and this is the Block Party Series, which is hosted by KRS-One. Hip-hop legend KRS-One headlined a block party on Cedric Avenue in the Bronx to mark the 50th birthday of hip-hop. The birthplace of hip-hop was a rec room at 1520 Cedric Avenue, where on August 11th, 1973, DJ Cool Herc and his sister, Cindy Campbell, threw a party and spun some records. We are in the birthplace of hip-hop. Hip-hop was born right here in 1973 when DJ Cool Herc put on a back-to-school block party. And here we are, KRS-One called my office, and he said, help us to get, to, to get something together. And I'm so proud that we were able to do that, not only for District 14, not only for the Bronx, but for hip hop, which is a national movement. The growth of hip hop has turned into a worldwide cultural phenomenon. It is a testament to the creativity, innovation, and passion of New York City. The city has been throwing block parties across the five boroughs to celebrate 50 years of hip hop. Bronx Native's owner, Amadeus Grujon, shares with us what this day means for him. 50 years of the culture. It feels good to be from the Mecca, to be part of history, to be part of the journey. It's something that started from a foundation of struggle, right? Our people were here, black and brown, disenfranchised community. We wanted to be heard, we wanted to be seen. And that is what hip hop is, is the sound, the voice of our people. The block party featured renowned DJs, street art installations, and much more. Founder and CEO of the Rough Riders, Joaquin Dean, helped introduce artists like DMX, Eve, Swiss Beats, The Locks, and others into the new sound of hip-hop culture. 50 years of hip-hop is, is the essence of culture. We standing on, the, on, on Mother Earth right here, right here in Cedric Avenue, 1520, the double R in the building. That's where we was born here. We was raised in hip-hop. So now we back where it all started 50 years later. We started right here in this playground from birth for me to about up to 10 years old. Right here in this park, we still doing the music, Swiss beats and all of them. Shout out to Little Wild Young Riders, you know, the Bronx net in the building. We here to represent our own, it's our culture. We own this, this is our house. You know what I'm saying? I'm wise CEO, Rough Riders checking out, let you know, salute to the world. Cheers to another 50 years of hip hop in the future. Reporting for BronxNet, Chanel Thompson. And thank you, Chanel. That is all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We are taking a quick break. But guess what? We got more open when we return. So as a technical sergeant, E6. I served in uh, Vietnam in 1969. I am a U.S. Army veteran. Have you ever helped a fellow veteran? Of course. Yes. Try to always be there uh, for each other. I do my best reaching out to my brothers and sisters in arms. Have you ever asked for help yourself? Uh, it's always tough, right? Um, <laughs> um, I can't say that I have. I mean, if you don't have someone to kind of help you guide those thoughts, it can be really bad. Eventually, you know, you just can't deal with it on your own. I guess it's a part of the military too, right? Service before self. It was drilled in, service before self. And you start to question, maybe people would be better off without me, you know? When you realize that, that you're not alone, once you take that first step, there's so much support. And we are back with Halloween right around the corner. Homeowners everywhere are putting in a little extra effort to give their homes a spooky and haunted Appearance. And uh, when homeowners delay routine maintenance tasks around the house, their homes can start to feel haunted year-round. And joining me now to discuss this topic is David Steckel, who is the home care expert at Thumbtack. And uh, David, we're so glad to have you with us. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about this here. You got some millennials right here. They actually say, I live in a haunted house. And why are they feeling this kind of way here? I, I was quite surprised with the numbers myself, and 40% of those surveyed said that at one point or another, they thought their house was haunted by a ghost. <laughs> and 47% of those because their doors were closing unexpectedly, 38% because of noises in the wall. And I hate to say it, but my wife was one of the 28% who thought the house was haunted because of some creaking floors. So 
I'm sitting here yesterday, my alarm goes off in the house, and I'm by myself, and you know, the lights go on and off, and I'm like, okay, this sounds a little, feels a little creepy. But the fact is that uh, if home maintenance, there's something to be said about home maintenance and making your house feel haunted. Exactly. Like, it's Halloween. We want our houses to be haunty, but a home ownership does not be need to be scary all year round. And the key is all of these things, especially the ones I just mentioned, are, are not due to paranormal activity. It's really just small fixes. So, for instance, the door closing on its own, in the ma vast majority of cases, that just requires a hinge adjustment. And that one's fairly simple. So if you're comfortable with some hand tools, you could do that yourself with a simple DIY project. When lights are flickering, the most common cause of that recently is because LED bulbs have a little chip in them that don't speak to dimmers in the same way that they used to. So you have to have an LED bulb that's compatible with an LED dimmer. So you might have to change one of those two. As it relates to like the creaking floors or noises in the wall, those ones are actually more complicated and also why Thumbtack is here. So you can speak to a pro and understand how to fix it and get them out to do the work. So you actually have a haunted house hotline. So let's talk about the haunted house hotline and who can use it. Well, everybody can use it. You go to thumbtack.com slash haunted and we have a team of home experts ready to help you determine is it Casper that's causing the problems or is it a lack of maintenance or something that you might not be aware of because that's the truth. Homes don't come with manuals and people that are moving in, they might not know what to do when to do it and who to hire. So that's why Thumbtack's here to help. And we talk about people who sometimes have that delay. They think, I can just put this off until later, I'll deal with this later. But there really are some repercussions when I don't really take care of home maintenance as soon as I possibly can. It's more about being preventative. That, that's really when things get scary. Anybody can tackle one thing at a time. But if you delay for too long, one thing tends to multiply. Just like if there's mice in the walls, they'll multiply. And when you have 10 or 20 things on your to-do list, you just don't want to deal with it and you walk away. But the problem there is if you avoid it, they tend to cost more to fix as well. So it's stressful, anxious, and there's a financial repercussion too. Yeah. So this uh, hotline, 24 hours or what? I mean, I, my ghost comes 24 hours. I mean, I, there's a possibility I can see a ghost <laughs> 24 hours, you're available? Well, I can't, I can't help you with the ghost 24 hours, but if you download the app from either of the app stores, you can be helped 24 hours a day, and the hotline is available for you as well. Yeah. But just until Halloween. Yeah. Well, what are some of these haunted uh, calls that you're getting these days? What are, 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 there any, uh, are there any particular trends we're seeing? L lots of trends. We've been seeing, not really haunted, though. We've been seeing a lot of folks investing in outdoor landscaping and getting their homes ready for the holidays after you know a few years of spending more time in the home. So upgrades, painting, just more aesthetic upgrades we're seeing. Um, but in that it's Halloween, I wish that there were some more paranormal activity on Thumbtack, but the truth is it's, it's often repairs and upgrades. Yeah, well, David, I want to let you know it's been great having you, certainly, uh, for people who want to keep their house from being haunted. Uh, you can definitely get in touch with David and the crew at Thumbtack. He's a home expert, and I uh, want to make sure that your home is ghost-proof this uh, holiday season. Thanks a lot for being with us, David. Thanks for having me. All righty. Now, listen, for more information, visit the website, thumbtack.com forward slash haunted. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more open coming up right after this. Even though we didn't grow up together, he's my favorite brother. Hey, sis. I'm the baby of the family, and he's the gentle giant. What you know about poor George? Man, please, that's a classic. You know when they say people are a rare breed? Yeah, he's that. I'm sorry, I'll be back in a few hours. Don't worry, sir, you know I'm for you. I know. Go get the football. That was my favorite memory. He was always for you. This is a true story of me, Bridget Floyd, and this guy, George Perry Floyd Jr., my big brother.
And welcome back. The inaugural Lehman College Digital Asset Conference will delve into the transformative power, power, I should say power of blockchain, as well as crypto assets and AI technologies. Now with a diverse lineup of speakers from academia and the private sector, the conference offers a dynamic exchange of ideas, insights, and valuable advice for all participants. Joining me now, we've got CUNY, Lehman College's Director of Experiential Learning and Partnerships at the School of Business, Lawrence Fauntleroy. And then we've got the Assistant Professor of the Department of Accounting, Dr. Sean Stein-Smith, and both of them are here with us. And uh, glad to have you both sharing. And uh, Lawrence, I'll start with you. I mean, this is, this is pretty important because you got a digital asset conference that's coming around the corner. Mm -hmm. And um, really, when we talk about digital, we've got crypto, we've got the emergence blockchain. of AI and blockchain. you're right, blockchain, mm -hmm. and this it's really pretty timely. Yeah, I think what what we tried to do is we're snowballing off of something that we started about two years ago. We had an upskilling program, and me and Dr. Sean Stein actually kind of collaborated on run, rolling out two classes, cryptocurrency and blockchain. We got a lot of momentum off of that. Our big goal, and, and one of the things that's important to us, is being on this train before it really starts moving. Um, it's harder to jump on a train when it's moving. So our big goal is to really have a center at Lehman College that is in the forefront of crypto and blockchain. Yeah. And Dr. Stein Smith, talk to me here, because, you know, we're talking about blockchain and crypto and AI. A little bit, if you will, on the relevance of this right now, because we are really on the cutting edge, and not on, I don't say we're on it, we're in it. Absolutely, yeah, and and honestly, these these applications and tools aren't just coming; they are already here. Every major financial institution in the five boroughs and over the whole country is actively developing, investing, and hiring people who are experts in these fields. Right? Blockchain, crypto assets, and AI are the tools and the platforms that are going to to create jobs and opportunities both now and going forward and so i'm really excited to be hosting our conference on the campus at lehman college as you outlined bringing in you know experts both uh academic ex experts industry experts to really have those conversations to honestly pop the hood on these tools and to figure out how they're being used and the opportunities being created yeah Lawrence, a little bit about mm -hmm. students right and people who want to participate Obviously, right now, AI, chat, GBT is the talk. Mm -hmm. if, if you don't know chat, GBT, you're almost like behind these days. Yeah. But yet and still, there are a lot of people who are behind. Mm -hmm. What are you hearing from students, people within the community in terms of the need to want to get the much needed, you know, get up, get up right. on their game, if you will? Well, from the students I'm hearing, they're using it period, end of story. It's part of their toolbox. Right. And so we really want to make sure they're using it the right way. They're, you know, there's a, such thing called prompt engineering that they're really using it so that they really get the maximum benefit out of it. And so it's really educating the rest of the community, probably people who thought that this wasn't going to come to Dr. Stein's point. It's already here. So we just want to make sure students are using it the right way, benefiting from it. And so it's, it's here, students are using it, and maybe people before our students that really need to get this, this kind of education. Yeah, Dr. Stein Smith, what do you want for takeaways when we talk about having this conference and people who are going to be a part of it? What are the key takeaways that we're looking to see? Yeah, sure. And so probably my, my top two or three hopes for, for real concrete takeaways are one, sort of moving beyond just the base level understanding, right? To understand how these tools are being used, be it AI, ChatGPT, or other AI tools out there, which I can also confirm are being used right now by pretty much everybody. And then, so, so how these tools are being used, where folks can learn more on these topics, be it blockchain, crypto assets, or AI. And then three, being able to understand and to be able to have conversations on how these tools connect to the roles being advertised right now, both for the employers and for our students. Yeah. For students, how do you feel they're going to benefit once this is all over with? Oh, I think there's a huge benefit. I think it's just going to solidify that the tools that they're using is exactly where they should be at. Um, part of my role is to be at the intersections between academic and industry. So knowing when they go into industry that they're already uh, up on some of these tools is just gives them a competitive advantage. 
let's talk about the program here at Lehman College because there is a program yes. here at Lehman College that, yes. that addresses this. There is. So uh, Dr. Stein, who is leading that charge on a, uh, on a minor in cryptocurrency and blockchain, and this all came out of our upskilling initiative. So he's been leading that charge. We're going to talk about that at the conference. If you're interested in taking a minor, you don't necessarily have to be an accounting major, but if you want to kind of get into that space and kind of understand it, this is a perfect, this is the perfect platform to do that. Yeah. Um, when we talk about students right now mm -hmm. and their their propensity to gravitate towards mm -hmm. the chat, GBT, AI, crypto, uh, blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what are some of the common mistakes that you're seeing that people really need to be talking about? That is, that's it. You Once you put it in, you don't <laughs> have to do anything else. Like, <laughs> like there is some management, there's some massaging of it, there's some kind of look at it and analyzing. It's a tool, it's not the answer. And I think that once students kind of understand that, I think that's where it gets better for them. Yeah. Dr. Stein Smith, from your perspective, I mean, obviously you're pretty excited about saying, listen, we're going to do this up here uh, at Lehman College. But from your perspective in the industry, uh, give me a sense of, you know, your, your thoughts right now, because this is really uh, equipping people for the present age and then also for the future. Absolutely. And so obviously, you know, probably right now, my own my own personal view via my industry connections are being cautiously optimistic, right? Because obviously, you know, there has been quite a bit of volatility in crypto. We, we have the trial going on right now about FTX and all the allegations there. And AI has its pros and cons, has to be trained, educated, prompted. But honestly, anybody and everybody I talk to are really excited on the opportunities embedded in these tools for faster, more encrypted, more transparent ways of storing, sharing, and accessing information, be it payments or otherwise. And honestly, accessing data and sort of leveraging that data is going to be how companies thrive going forward. And so having our students be uh, engaging with these topics via our courses, via the undergraduate minor, or at the conference really is a opportunity for us at the college and for our students to really sort of tap into this uh, enthusiasm on these topics. Uh, Dr. Stein Smith, stay with me on this here because I want to talk about it being, you know, having a, a program at a college, at a campus, sure. um, you know, I think this is great. I mean, I think really we need to be talking about this at the elementary school level these days, right? But the reality, yeah, absolutely. Is, but the reality is, that they can't, you know, the horse is already out of the barn and you're doing a great job of getting people caught up. But um, talk to me about your feeling in the academic space of really addressing this. Yeah, and so overall, sort of my attitude towards how academia has been understanding these tools is a lot more positive now in 2023, right? And institutions of any kind, be they academic or otherwise, always take time to analyze, understand, and, and to then figure out how to integrate new ideas and tools into their product offerings, be it courses, minors. But I'm really, really excited to have this undergraduate minor. And I believe it is one of the first, if not the first, in the whole CUNY network on these topics being offered at that undergraduate minor level. And it really is a, a excellent blend, I think, of sort of research, uh, introductory information on these topics, and then also how, how these tools and applications are impacting accounting, finance, economics, marketing, every aspect of business, and in turn, business impacts every single major. Yeah, so Lawrence, really Lawrence is shaking his head, amen, amen, all the way through this. So <laughs> I, I want you to, uh, to get people the information about the conference, because they have an opportunity to still uh, take place. It takes about four hours, right? But, it uh, yep, it's, it's 12 to 4. It's Wednesday, October 25th. It's at Lehman College at our music building. You can go on lehmandigital.org to sign up and register. Um, we're going to have a ball. We're going to have a ball. One of the things I love with, with, with Dr. Stein is doing, and we have this kind of theory, is that we got to move like a speedboat. We can't move like an ocean line. It's just too, that's just too slow. We got to just really move quick in this, and we got to be at the forefront of it. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the dangers is that, as you, as you point, that I could really mm -hmm. talk today about AI, and then tomorrow we can talk conceive we'll be talking about something else. Completely something else. Completely. And I can still be so lost. I mean, mm -hmm. I thought, you know, people out there thinking, listen, I got the internet, I know how to do Google, <laughs> right? Now it's like, uh, Google, yes. internet, you're like, that's that's data. That's yeah. black and white that television compared yeah. to A&I. Absolutely, 1,000%.
1,000%. And then crypto and blockchain. I, mean, I think a lot of people, too, when you talk about investing and knowing uh, the future, uh, investing is major. So uh, Dr. Stein Smith, talk to me about this here because knowing you know, that we're still navigating the crypto and, and, and the controversy there, but, but really becoming more familiar and having your hand in the basket really is more advantageous than you sitting there just watching. Yes, and, and sort of on that point, it is impossible for any program, for any institution to be able to pivot every single day on every hot topic or on every new crypto right. asset out there. And so that's why our focus really is you're trying to hone in on the underlying fundamentals of blockchain, of AI, of, of tokenized assets, and really trying to educate and inform students and members of the community so that everybody is better able to make better choices, both now and going forward, both personally in the workplace and on how they manage their own financial life. Yeah. So that's really our focus, is, is to more focus on the, on the big trends and, and to not chase every single headline out there. Yeah. Dr. Stein, Smith, great having you. I'm going to get Lawrence to tell us right now, again, the Digital Asset Conference does give us the date, time, and where we, where people can go. Date, October 25th, 12 to 4, Lehman College. The music building will be on the first floor. You'll see us. Um, you, good food, good people, good company. Great, <laughs> great people to learn from, so we're excited about it. For my context, good food is always a yeah, draw. Yeah, you know? I'm just, I'm it's always a draw. <laughs> <laughs> good to have you, Lawrence. You too, Darren. Dr. My St pleasure. Dr. Stein Smith, thank you for being with us. Listen, now if you want more Thanks information, you. visit the website, lehmandigital.org. Don't go anywhere. we got more show coming up right after this. Hey, boss. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. You sure? I said I'm fine. Since I was little, it was only like me and my parents. You think you created family out of characters? Yeah, of course. I'm gonna take that and make it into a song. Me to bed, see you in the morning. With the first thing, Superman, but it wasn't on it. And we lost it. Hey, son. Hey, Bob. You can talk to me. It's been really, really hard for me. And we are back. The African Diaspora International Film Festival is a not-for-profit organization that's devoted to showcasing global films, exploring the diverse experiences of people of color. They seek to inspire and challenge stereotypes and promote cultural diversity and social awareness. Adif believes in the unifying power of film foster empathy, understanding, and positive change. Joining us now and sharing more, we got giving us insight is the 2023 African Diaspora International Film Festival's coordinator and co-curator. -cura we've got Lorado Bocaco, and then we've also got the director of the film through our lens, we've got Chico Jiroge, and we thank you both for joining us. Did I say that right? You got yes, it, perfect. Did. Uh, I got to start off good, you know, with y'all, because if not, I'm going to hear about it. So thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess I'll start off a little bit with uh, Lorado. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, this film festival, it's got to be very special uh, to be able to have it and at the same time showcasing a lot of great talent. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, yes, we are very excited to be presenting the 31st edition of the festival this year from November 24 to December 10 around New York City. We have 80 films that will be screening this year from 33 different countries, so countries. So it's a lot to see and a lot of talented filmmakers that, who will be present and screening their films. Yeah, Shigo, you're one of them. I know you got through, your, through our lens and uh, for people who may not be so familiar, talk us, uh, walk us through about your film. Yeah, so I'm an emerging filmmaker and I'm continually being inspired and looking to learn from those who have come before me and paved the way for me and others to do this type of work. And so the project actually ended up becoming a love letter to other filmmakers and other black photographers. 
and we were particularly interested in how images have brought truth to power by capturing the black experience. Um, if you come to mind film, uh, pictures like Martin Luther King Jr. marching on Washington or Malcolm X peering behind the curtains uh, with a rifle in his hand, um, you know, worried about assassins that could be nearby. Um, and another, another photograph that comes to mind is through the bravery and courage of his mother, the horrifying image of Emmett Till's uh, body after his murder, which brought a lot of awareness to uh, ignorant Americans who were oblivious to the atrocities that were happening to black folk right nearby and actually became the catalyst to start the civil rights movement. And so we were really interested in how images have shown the black experience through thick and thin, through our resilience, and have been a way to magnify that this fight for our liberation and for our, our freedom is legitimate and it's something that is con continually ongoing. Yeah, and uh, I think I'll, either one of you can answer, but I think we're seeing an emergence. We've already seen it prior to, but we're seeing an emergence more of social justice in filmmaking. And from your perspective, why do you think? Do you think it's the times that we're living in right now that causes us to say, listen, we need to pay more attention to this and we need to bring this to the stage even more? I think showing people's stories helps to connect with people and you have more empathy with for somebody if you are more familiar with their story as opposed to just having a blank face on an entire group of people. So I think it's a very in important tool for connection for people as well as to foster empathy. Yeah, and if I could add to that, I think through the process of our work, of the archival research of finding photographs through history that showcase the black experience, we found that we could only go so far back before every photo that was capturing the black experience, for example, during the civil rights movement was credited by white photographers and it wasn't so long ago. And so through making the film, we were reminded that it's still a very radical thing for black people to be behind the camera, capturing our stories mm -hmm. for other black people. Yeah, very important. And uh, another thing I wanted to, talk, to uh, discuss really was topic, uh, topic is uh, mental health and film, uh, because we're seeing more and more films now gravitate to talking about that. But uh, I know in this film festival, uh, attention is being paid there too. Yes, yeah, so for example, a film like Elephant, which shows a woman who's grappling with mental health after seeing the news of a black man who's been killed at her doorstep. And she's grappling with how she's processing this information and she's feeling agoraphobic and she's self-isolating. And we see a woman trying to overcome this. And I, it's really important to see it from the perspective of the filmmaker who's going through it herself from the perspective of a woman, from the perspective of a black woman. Um, yeah, I think it is a really great tool to to show and to um, to show something like mental health and how people can overcome it, how they go through it. Yeah. Shigo, for yourself, being a filmmaker right now and having the ability to have people look at the screen and be able to take away your heart and your vision, what is the takeaway that you're wanting people to have when it comes to your film and then also your work? Yeah, I would say that I think I'm so honored to be a part of this year's program of the African Diaspora International Film Festival. And more than that, I'm actually looking forward to the event to be surrounded by other, like so much talent and excellence of, of people who, filmmakers and artists who are similarly making stories that show the expansiveness and the diversity within the black community and as a black collective. And so I think the main takeaway with this, with, with the films that, that are being showcased in this film festival in general is just how diverse and expansive it truly is to be black in America, to be black in, uh, you know, across the world, like to be a part of the African diaspora. And particularly for this film, we're looking to show that this fight is ever going, the liberation for our rights and our freedoms and to be seen as individuals and humans. Um, throughout the film, we use a lot of, we, we use all photographs that are captured by black photographers. And we also interspice throughout the film ar archival footage taken by my partner, Timothy Richardson, during a George Floyd protest. And so 
having that as a connective tissue in the film shows that this fight that is happening currently, that happened in 2020, that's happening in 2023, that was ongoing, that started in the 1960s, 1940, you know, ever since, you know, through, throughout history, that this is one continuous march towards, towards our freedoms and our liberations. And um, yeah, I'm excited for people to see how they can also be activists in their own rights through documentation, through uh, capturing art, through um, expressing art, and through consuming art. Yeah. Lorado, your take on the evolution of African cinema as we see mm -hmm. it continue to emerge, and we're seeing now, you know, more and more people attending. Uh, your, your, your thoughts? Yeah, so I, it's really exciting to see so many young African and emerging African filmmakers really take center stage. I'm really excited in particular in this festival, we have a program that I co-curated called the Spotlight on South Africa program, past and present. And there we show South Africa during apartheid era, the pre-1994 era, and we show the expressions of filmmakers in the country at the time and commenting on the socio-political climate of the country at the time. And then we move over from the mid 90s to present day South Africa, and we see what filmmakers are saying now about the state of the country, some of the consequences of an apartheid in South Africa, what that looks like now for young people, um, and how we got here. So, a program like that is very exciting to me. And we'll be having two filmmakers from the program, Bev Ditsi, who directed Simon and I, which is a documentary about two activists, so Bev herself, as well as Simon Guli, who worked to get LGBTQ rights in, in the new South African Bill of Rights, as well as Angus Gibson, who directed Back of the Moon, which is a romantic drama about a young man who refuses to leave his home the night before that the police were scheduled to forcibly remove the residents of Sophia Town. And he meets a young lady named Eve, a young singer, who is also able to leave the country the following day. So we'll have those two filmmakers talking about their experience working as filmmakers in South Africa during apartheid South Africa, and as well as present day South Africa. And we say the evolution of the film industry in South Africa through these films. Yeah. So Shigo, for people who want to catch your work, I mean, obviously the film festival is one place, but in addition to that, where else? Yeah, I'm I'm on on the social media as Chico Ever After. Um, for, please check me out there. And um, one work that I I'm actually very inspired by what was just said because um, I'm a Kenyan American and uh, currently working on a documentary that uh, showcases disability advocacy in Kenya and bringing more awareness to that through um, athletes who um, are, are deaf and hard of hearing. And so that's an upcoming project that I'm looking forward to sharing. Uh, well, I want you to know that we're looking forward to seeing it and uh, continued success on the work that you're doing, Chico. And then, Lorado, thank you for uh, what you're doing to really spread the word and really uh, give artists a platform. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And I just wanted to say that tickets are on sale on nyadif.org yeah. for, for the screenings. Kind of stole my thunder, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell them again. I'm Have sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Listen, if you want more information, do that. Visit the website at nyadif.org, and then uh, you can get those tickets and see Lorado and Chico and uh, the rest of the crew. All right, we don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Open coming up right after this. done the hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. 
Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. And we are back in the realm of education. Remarkable developments are underway with the integration of augmented reality, better known as AR technology, right in the classroom. Snap Incorporated is collaborating with InSpirit to introduce immersive AR learning solutions to educational institutions with the aim of transforming the traditional learning experience and showcasing its positive impact. Joining us now and sharing for an insightful discussion are Sophia Dominguez, who's the Director of AR Platform Partnerships Ecosystem at Snap Incorporated. And then we've got Amrutha Vasan, who is the co-founder and CEO of InSpirit. And uh, thank you both for joining us. And uh, I'll start off a little bit with Amrutha. And uh, there's this partnership between Snap and then also InSpirit. Uh, let's get to the background. How did this partnership come about? Yeah. Sure. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I was just going to say that um, we're really excited to work with Snap to bring their AR technology to the classroom. And I'd love to just ask Sophia a little bit about this, just given why Snap is choosing to venture into education. Yeah, so at Snap, um, we felt you know, very passionately about InSpirit's mission of making STEM and STEM learning more interactive and engaging. And so augmented reality is already being used to enhance communication and creativity. We just believe it has so much potential for education. So this partnership is a really exciting step forward to prove how AR can be beneficial for learning. Yeah. And when we talk about AI being beneficial for learning, I want to talk a little bit more, Sophia, about this, because how can students actually, you know, benefit in their environments through augmented reality? Yeah, it's a great question. So augmented reality can help simplify complex concepts like math and science lessons by creating hands-on learning experiences without blocking out the real world. So whether students are learning from the classroom or at home. Yeah, and Ruth, we know that there's gonna be some curriculum coming to students next year. So how does this AR uh, you know, curriculum fit in uh, in the future? And what, we're gonna, what are we gonna see in the classroom? Yeah, so um, AR is an extremely powerful learning tool. And so we actually conducted a case study through our research at Stanford University to measure the impact of AR in the classroom using an interactive AR geometry curriculum that we had built for middle school students. And so we actually worked directly with educators to develop this interactive AR curriculum to ensure that it drove real student outcomes. And we had the students basically learning how to calculate the volume of a cylinder, calculate the volume of a sphere, and then they would take those skills and then build an interactive rocket and launch it in AR. Um, and so we found that these experiences actually increased student engagement by 50%. And the students also believed that it improved their memory and their knowledge retention in these complex topics. Yeah, I, I want to take a, a, a two words that we hear a lot, with that is experience, experiential learning. Uh, and when we talk about experiential learning, first give me a little bit of a breakdown and then talk to me about um, how this is really impacting through XR experiences. And, you know, it's a little complex, but I'm sure most of us can get a you know pretty down-to-earth answer here. Yeah, so experiential learning is exactly what it is, right? You're trying to give yourself experiences to actually learn a concept. And so a way that many schools do it today is they take you on a field trip, right? If you're learning about nature, they take you to a park, they show you what a tree actually looks like, they show you the leaves. Now, the cool thing about XR, it's just XR is extended reality, so we're extending your reality, right? So um, what we're doing is there are probably things that are impossible to do in the real world. They're too dangerous, they're too expensive, or it's just impossible, right? And so what we do is we create these experiences that students uh, can use to learn these complex topics. And a lot of STEM topics get complicated pretty quickly. So um, students can use these XR uh, tools in the classroom to actually help them on their homework assignments or their worksheets or even for task prep uh, to make sure that they really understand what they're learning. Yeah, and remember there is an innovative learning hub that bridges the gap between uh, students' comprehension uh, as well as engagement. Talk to me about this here because I want to talk a little bit about uh, this learning hub and uh, you can share more. Yeah, so the innovative learning hub is actually a combination of VR, virtual reality, um, web experiences, and AR. So we work across multiple platforms and we work with whatever devices the students happen to have or the schools happen to have. And so uh, what we see is students get to immerse themselves in different roles 
and in different worlds, basically. And so this actually improves their confidence in the subject. It also improves their engagement. And by giving them these interactive experiences once in a while throughout their curriculum, it actually motivates them to go back and study the material and, you know, actually motivates them in STEM as well. So what we see is students that are not great at STEM, you know, students that are average, are now motivated to potentially even pursue a STEM career or to pursue something else within this field. And Sophia, I know that more and more students are really gravitating towards, I talk, we talked a little bit about AI in the previous segment, but now I talk about augmented reality. Uh, you got to see more and more people gravitating to wanting to know more about AR. Yeah, and, and, you know, obviously artificial intelligence is also a huge market, and that's something that we're also incorporating into our AR technologies. Um, we have a few generative AI announcements to come um, in about a few weeks at our um, annual developer event, which is called LensFest. Um, and so you'll start to see more of these AI and AR worlds start to combine, and we'll use AI to really make it easier for people around the world to more easily create AR experiences and then also interact with them. Yeah. And Sophia, I mean, it's really revolu revolutionizes a, a child's life. I mean, to really go into augmented reality, to have the opportunity to learn more about it, and then to apply it. I mean, you know, when we look about a child's uh, it, 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 a use experience, you got to say this is something that's going to take them into way into the future. Totally. And I think the feedback that we've been receiving from students um, that was highlighted in the case study that Amrutha covered before, it just, you know, even one quote from one of the students said that they felt that they learned better by observing instead of reading. And so this is really the future. And we're very excited to work with in spirit um, on this and um, really bring the future of education into AR. Yeah. And so where do we get more information? Yeah, you can head over to inspiritvr.com for more info, and you can also download a demo and try out these experiences that we've been talking about today. Well, that's awesome. I want to thank you both for sharing with us, and certainly uh, when we talk about, we talked in the previous segment about AI, now we're at AR, and uh, people just got to just get in where they fit in and jump in here because there's so much out there, uh, and we want people to become so connected to what's out there that they can be able to prosper. Thank you both for sharing with us today. Thank you so much Thanks. for having us. All righty. Well, again, if you want more information, visit the website at inspiritvr.com. And we encourage you, don't go anywhere. We're coming back with more open right after this. It's important to get a flu shot each and every year because flu viruses are constantly changing and immunity from the vaccine decreases over time. Flu vaccines are updated annually to work against that year's viruses. The best time to get your shot is in the fall but getting it later can still help. Getting a flu shot lowers your risk of getting sick. And if you do happen to get flu, it's likely to be less severe. We all know what it's like to feel alone, but it just takes one new connection. Wanna get out of here? To empower many. This is unbelievable. It doesn't take a superhero to bring forces together. We all have the power to reach out. Let's go! And help someone feel like they belong. Pretty cool, huh? We are stronger together. And welcome back. The Bronx Community College's Disability Services Office has the mission of supporting students with disabilities and ensuring they have equal access to educational opportunities. Now, with October being National Disability Employment Awareness Month, the college has developed a partnership with Empire Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Join me now and here to share insight is CUNY Bronx Community College's Disability Services Director, Maria J. Pantoja, and we thank you so much for being with us. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, to talk about disabilities, obviously, is very important because uh, we are here in this month, but it really is something that many students across our, our CUNY campuses are facing and dealing with, and you do a great job of really being able to provide and meet their needs. Yes, at Bronx Community College, our office 
provide services to students with disabilities. The process is slightly different between high school and college. That's what is very, very important for students to know that they have to self-disclose to the Office of Disability Services in order for them to request accommodations. We provide accommodations as extended time in service, separate location, maybe a, a, an assistive technology device that can help them succeed in college. In my position, I oversee the LEADS program. The LEADS, LEADS stands for Linking Employment, Academics and Disability Services. Our goal is to provide career guidance from day number one. Mm -hmm. Students will learn about job opportunities, internship opportunities and soft skills. So when a person comes in, they first have to self-disclose, right? And then after they self-disclose, then you have the opportunity to give them connect them to the variety of different services. Um, what are some of the more prevalent services that you're seeing students take advantage of? The students take advantage of our note-taking applications. Uh, we have a lot of assistive technology um, that we share with our students. We train them and in addition to that, we provide testing accommodations. Uh, students in high school, they receive something that is called extended time in testing, and this accommodation is also provided in, um, in college. Mm -hmm. We hear a lot about online learning and remote learning. I mean, this is what's happened since COVID, a lot of people are still trying to make the adjustment. How are you able to assist those in this community who are really struggling with, you know, maybe online or remote learning? Um, believe it or not, uh, COVID was a bless because once we transitioned all our curriculum online, students with disability got access to our, uh, to our courses in their homes, mm -hmm. uh, providing accessibility for those who, who cannot uh, commute to the campus. And so this month we've got National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and uh, talk to us a little bit. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this here. What goes on throughout the course of the month? Uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. We take pride that uh, during the past four years we have developed a relationship with Blue Cross Blue Shell Empire, and where they not only have donated funds, thousands of dollars, to students with disabilities for their unique needs. In addition to that, every year they open their doors to our students for a disability mentoring day. Our students are able to meet with Empire workers with and without disabilities and learn about the do's and don'ts of job hunting. And for people who don't, are not so familiar, it's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in order to make it happen. Um, and then you have a student that you impact. What are some of the stories that you may think out in your mind about how you've been able to impact uh, students to make that difference in their lives? I think that I have seen my students take on part-time jobs, full-time jobs, and, 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 and become fully independent. Mm -hmm. um, we have many, many cases, especially for the ones that they work closely with the office, we are able to help them transition to employment. And earlier we talked about disclosing, right? Because the student has to be able to disclose in order to make that happen. Um, what are some of the best ways that students go about disclosing? Uh, because it's a real sensitive area sometimes. Uh, the student must know that all the information that they provide with our office will remain with our office. Uh, students can self-disclose by completing our, our, our online application in our website and providing Medical documentation, they can do it by fax or ho however they feel more comfortable. If they choose to meet with a disability accommodation specialist over the phone, they can do that. We are providing services online, over the phone, or in person. So, if they, so most of our students, believe it or not, after COVID, they feel more comfortable with a phone interview. Um, once the process is complete and they are registered with our office, um, they will receive our services. Yeah, and so for yourself, obviously it's a great feeling to be able to help students out at this level and really make a difference for them. What about bridging the gap between faculty, staff, getting that word across? What do you do about getting the word across to the campus about the Office of Disability Services? That, that's a great question. Um, 
the accommodation process is an interactive process between the student, faculty member, and the Office of Disability Services. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide a lot of training to faculty. We have trans transitioned to uh, online content, um, so faculty is new to creating online content, accessible online content. So our office ha has taken the role of guiding faculty on how to uh, create this content. Uh, students know from day one that if they have a difficult, they are experiencing some difficult with a faculty member, they must bring the concern to our attention. We don't want the students to go and, and, and try to negotiate their accommodation with the faculty member. As students know that we are here to help them and that we are here to advocate for them. Mm -hmm. So Disability Awareness, we provide a lot of workshops for faculty. Our website has a lot of resources for faculty on how to, um, how to provide the services to, to our students. Yeah, navigating it is, uh, you know, it sometimes can be hard, but when you have a lot of information out there with faculty, obviously, they get the information, it makes life a little bit more easier for them in terms of understanding. Are you finding that more and more people are coming into a better understanding of the needs of those in the disabled community? Yes, I think that we are moving towards. Um, uh, it's not ideal yet, mm -hmm. but I think that we're working on it, and I think that I want to highlight that at BCC, a lot of our faculty are invested in our students, so they will go the extra mile to provide uh, the accommodations to our students. Tell me about some of the challenges that you're actually facing, though. The challenges that we are facing, um, I think that a stigma. I, I, I think that students do not want to, to, to register with our office right. because in the past they have been labeled. So they want to try them on their, their own. And although our services are, students are aware of our services from uh, once they are accepted to college, we have our disability statement. Mm -hmm. So they know that our services are available for them. They choose not to register with our office. So sometimes they fail a couple of semesters until they said, you know what, I think I need, I need my extra time. I need my services. And, and sometimes it, it's a little too late. Right. Now we're working. Um, or on appeals and trying to to help the student to come back from from those semesters. Yeah, because sometimes the perception, right? There's a perception and there's a bias there, and that bias becomes so hard to overcome. Yes, and I think that the transition between high school and college is definitely problematic. Uh, mm -hmm. Students in high school are labeled, uh, unfortunately, and the accommodation is provided directly by the teacher. In higher education, the student can pick and choose. I want to receive my accommodation in this class, but I don't want to receive my accommodation in that class. I want to self-disclose, or I don't want to self-disclose. Um, so having that freedom uh, of not being labeled, I think that that is very, very important. Yeah, Maria J. Pantoja, thank you so much for being with us. Great work that you're doing over there at Bronx Community College, and uh, keep it up. Thank you. All righty. Well, now, if you want more information, visit the website at bccuny.edu and then call them, 718-289-5874. Well, we come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewer, for tuning in. And if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch ReCableCast on Optimus Channel 67, Verizon Files Channel 2133, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. And of course, you can catch a brand new episode of Open on Friday with my girl, Rita Valentine. Well, that about wraps up this episode for us. I am Darren Hyman. We say make sure to keep this channel wide open. We say take care. God bless. We'll see you back soon. <laughs>